Well, we welcome you to our uh, last uh, lesson in Romans. Uh, this is lesson 17, but we're going to be going from Romans chapter 15, verse 8, all the way to the end of the letter. Now, uh, that may seem like a lot, but a lot of the letter <clears throat> from this point on is uh, filled up with really incidental things and little greetings uh, that uh, we find uh, Paul uh, extending to the people and the Christians that were in Rome. Anyway, uh, let's pray as we get started here, and hopefully that this will still uh, be a blessing, and that God might be able to still speak to you uh, through this time as we spend it in his word. So, Heavenly Father, we ask you now to send the Holy Spirit, and that we might be able to take to heart the things that uh, we read, and that, Lord, that you would minister truth uh, into us, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, we begin uh, with Romans chapter 15 and verses 8 through 13. For I say, Christ, to become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God, in order to establish the promises of the fathers, indeed the Gentiles, to glorify God, just as it has been written, Therefore I shall confess you to the Gentiles, and in your name I sing. And again it says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise all the Gentiles the Lord, and praise him all peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse and the one being raised up to rule the Gentiles, upon whom the Gentiles hope. Indeed, the God of hope to fill all of you with joy and peace in order to believe into which you to abound in the hope in power of the Holy Spirit. All right. So um, in Paul's closing thoughts uh, here in this uh, letter, he is uh, going uh, to, he's pointing us uh, to the fact that God had already, or had always, already too, but had always had in mind that he was going to reach the Gentiles, that the salvation was not just for the Jews. Now, Paul's talked about that before, but here he's coming back to kind of reinforce that same idea. Uh, and he makes it clear that this was not just something that was a novel idea to him uh, and that no one had ever thought of this before, but he uh, goes about to establish that this was something that was spoken in the Old Testament scriptures, that there were many prophecies, some of which he mentions here, we'll get to in a moment, uh, that indicated that God was going to save Gentiles, people like you and me. Uh, that is, unless there is a Messianic uh, Jewish person who is uh, uh, taking this course. But uh, that us who are Gentiles, as we've said earlier, uh, that we have been grafted uh, into the vine of Israel. We have become a part of the new Israel, which is those who believe in Jesus, uh, regardless of whether they are Jews or Gentiles. But anyway, Paul establishes this on the word of God. And this is really an important insight for us because uh, whenever God uh, speaks, he confirms what he has already said. He builds on what he has already said. And the New Testament built on what was already spoken about uh, in the Old Testament. Now, of course, when the New Testament came to an end and the, uh, the story was finished, uh, in a sense, the book was done. That Jesus was the last chapter uh, in this book. Uh, and uh, once that his message, as recorded uh, by the apostles, uh, was set down, that was the end of any kind of doctrinal revelation that God is not going to come up with any new doctrines uh, after the uh, New Testament was completed. That was the end uh, of revelations about doctrinal matters. Uh, that's why uh, those of us uh, who are uh, Reformation-minded uh, uh, Christians uh, believe in sola scriptura. Uh, we don't believe that any pope or any church council uh, can come along and give to us a new revelation, that everything uh, that God has revealed has been revealed in Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't speak. 
uh, today. He does speak to us through the word uh, and that uh, uh, the the purpose or the, the goal, uh, if you will, of, uh, of Christian uh, ministers of the gospel and indiv even individual Christians uh, as they read the Bible uh, is for God to speak to them and give them insights. And that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit opens our minds to see truth uh, and to see how that truth applies in our lives. That's why many Christians will tell you that they have read the same passage of scripture over and over again, and then they see something new that they had never seen before. It's always been there, but they just didn't see it. Uh, we also know that God can speak in personal ways to guide us in our lives. Uh, but whenever God gives us a word of guidance, uh, one of the things that we have to make sure of is, is in, in alignment with scripture. Uh, is it not simply some, something that somebody else said or some uh, opinion uh, writer said, but is this something that is in conformity with what God has revealed to us uh, about himself in the scriptures? So we go on now to verse eight. For I say, Christ, to become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God, in order to establish the promises of the fathers. So Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament uh, promises uh, about what God was going to do for the human race, particularly what God was going to do for us uh, through the gospel. Now, when Jesus came, uh, his first priority was to make this gospel known to the Jews. That is to bring it out of the Old Testament and to make it uh, understandable to the Jewish people, uh, and then to build on that message for them. But Jesus did not totally ignore uh, Gentiles. Uh, we know that uh, the very beginning of his life, uh, that it was Gentile magi, wise men, that came and worshiped him. Uh, we know that uh, it was prophesied that he was to be a hope unto the Gentiles, not just the Jews. Uh, when he was uh, uh, began his ministry, he primarily ministered to Jewish people, but every once in a while, uh, he ministered to Gentiles like the Syrophoenician woman. You remember her, that uh, she came asking Jesus to uh, heal her daughter from a demon. Uh, and, uh, and Jesus at first said that we shouldn't give the, the children's uh, food to the dogs, uh, which was a testing of her faith. But she said, even the dogs get the crumbs uh, under the table. And so Jesus said, because of your faith, uh, your daughter has been healed. And then, of course, there is the centurion, the Roman centurion, who asked Jesus to come and uh, uh, heal his uh, servant. Uh, it was a child servant, someone who worked in his home that he loved and cared about very much. Uh, and uh, uh, Jesus said, I'll come. But then he says, uh, you don't need to come in person because uh, I know that you can just say the word uh, and my, my servant will be healed. Uh, and, uh, and he said, I, I am a man under authority and I have others who are under my authority. I tell a, ser a soldier to do this and he does it. I tell uh, a, a servant to do this and he does it. So I know that you can simply speak the word uh, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says about that Gentile, I have not found this kind of faith even in Israel. Uh, and so it is that Jesus came to bring the gospel, not just to the Jews, but to, uh, to, to the Gentile world, uh, the, the world uh, that uh, would, did not have uh, the covenants and the scriptures and the patriarchs that the Jews had, uh, but oftentimes uh, were the enemies of the Jews, fought against the Jews, fought against God, but God uh, had a way of reaching out to them and bringing them in. And then we look at verses uh, 9 through 12. Indeed, the Gentiles do to glorify God just as it has been written. Therefore, I shall confess you to the Gentiles, and in your name I sing. 
And again it says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise all the Gentiles, the Lord, and praise him, all peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse and the one being raised up to rule the Gentiles until, until, upon the, whom the Gentiles hope. That is, on that Messiah. Well, here, uh, Paul gives us a uh, various Old Testament scriptures to establish the point that this was not something that was a new revelation, uh, that it was something that God had in mind from the very beginning, uh, was to reach out to the whole world uh, with the gospel message. Uh, now, the quotes he takes are from uh, 2 Samuel. might want to just jot these down. We're not going to take time to read to go and look up each one, but I'll give them to you. 2 Samuel 22:50 is the first one. It says, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing praises to your name. And then he quotes Psalm 18:49, For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Deuteronomy 32:43 says, Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods, <clears throat> for he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. And then Psalm 117, verse 1, Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. And finally, Isaiah 11:10. In that day, the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Uh, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Now, we may wonder why it is that all these scriptures about the Gentiles, uh, and this is just a few of them uh, in the Old Testament, were there and that the Jews read these scriptures, and yet they missed the point for so long. Well, Paul says that this was a mystery that was hidden from them. In Ephesians 3, 8 and 9, if you want to jump over there, I'll give you a moment to get over to Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. Uh, Ephesians 3, 8 and 9 is a little past Romans, of course, uh, but you're probably very familiar with getting around the Bible now, uh, if you weren't already even before the course. But anyway, Ephesians 3, 8, 9, uh, to me, the least of all the saints, this grace was given to bring good news to the Gentiles, the fathomless riches of Christ, and to bring to light all what is the stewardship of the mystery, which had been hidden from ages in God, the one creating all things through Jesus Christ. So God... Uh, kept these things a mystery, but he raised up Paul particularly, others as well, but Paul particularly, to bring out this mystery, which had always been there. Uh, in some ways, uh, this is like when we are reading scripture and uh, read a particular passage of scripture many times and just never saw uh, an insight that God gives to us because it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the truth of God's word to our hearts. And until the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, opens our ears, opens our hearts, uh, we miss those things. Well, that's what it was like for the Jews when they were reading the Old Testament, is that they would read, but they wouldn't see. They had eyes, but they could not see, Jesus said. They had ears, but they could not hear. And so it is that we need the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes to see the mysteries that God wants to reveal to us. And then we look at uh, verse 13. Indeed, the God of hope to fill all of you with joy and peace in order to believe into which you uh, to abound in the hope, into which you to abound in the hope and power of the Holy Spirit. So again, Paul points out the, uh, the fact that we are dependent on God for faith. It, God must reveal these things to us. 
Faith is not something that we can self-produce. It is a gift of God. Now, we might be able to believe in certain things um, because uh, uh, somebody convinces us or proves us, uh, proves that to us. But unless it is the Holy Spirit that speaks into our hearts, uh, that just as easily as somebody has argued us into believing something, uh, the devil can send somebody else along to argue us out of believing in it. So it, we need God. God is the one who gives the true gift of faith. And it comes as we experience the joy and the peace of the gospel and the hope that is stirred up in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this doesn't mean that we can wait for faith to simply drop out of the sky. No, the Holy Spirit works through means, as we saw back in Romans 10, uh, that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So God uses the word to open our hearts to be able to understand the word. And when the word works, uh, and in our faith, and faith is uh, created uh, in our hearts, then we begin to understand more and more of what the word says. Uh, so we need to put ourselves in the place where God can speak to us. And that is where the word is proclaimed. That's why the church is so important. This idea that uh, evangelicals have oftentimes touted uh, that you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, of course that's right, um, because we know that uh, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian. But uh, it is where the word uh, and the sacraments are administered. And so if we want to have a strong abiding faith, a living true faith, a certainty and a confidence uh, in Christ, then the best place to go is to go where the word of God is being proclaimed in truth uh, and uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit working through the word can create faith in our hearts so that that faith uh, becomes unshakable. Uh, so uh, we shouldn't be too uh, quick at saying, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And though that's true, you can hear the word of God uh, through watching an online teaching like this. But primarily, you have to go to the church, to a church which is proclaiming the word of God so that you can hear it and the Holy Spirit can minister to you through that word. Well, let's continue now with Romans chapter 15 and verses 14 through 21. But I have been persuaded, my brothers, that you yourselves are goodness filled, having been filled with all knowledge, being able to also to warn one another. Indeed, boldly, I write to you in part as reminding you again through the grace being given to me from God, in order that I be a servant of Christ Jesus unto the Gentiles, serving the gospel as a priest in order that it, that it, the offering of the Gentiles, may be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have a boast in Christ Jesus, uh, things before God. For I will not dare something to say of which Christ did not work through me unto the obedience of the Gentiles, in word and in work, in miracles, and signs and wonders in the miracles of the Spirit of God, so that I from Jerusalem and the circle around Illyricum to make the full gospel of Christ, uh, to, to make it known. Indeed, uh, thus aspiring to preach where Christ is not named in order that I do not build upon the foundation of another, but just as it has been written, to those whom it has not been reported concerning him, they shall see. And those not having heard, they shall understand. So here Paul is defending his ministry to the Gentiles uh, because God called him to this ministry. 
He realizes that he has been daring in this letter to speak in such clear, direct ways to those that he has never met. These people never met Paul, right? Uh, this is that one letter, uh, I guess, along with the uh, letter to the uh, Colossians, uh, where Paul did not personally know this church. But he dared to speak so directly to them uh, with such conviction and such insight because he knew that God had called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So let's look at verse 14. But I have been persuaded, my brothers, that you yourselves are goodness filled, having been filled with all knowledge, being all able also to warn one another. So Paul wants to be clear here that he's not assuming that they cannot teach and warn each other, that he is simply wanting to bring in and add the insights that God has given to them. And he speaks of them as being goodness filled. I think that's a very important uh, thing for us to understand uh, because uh, it's not that Christians are good, uh, as Jesus said, that only one who is good, and that's God. And of course, he himself, because he's God in the flesh. So uh, he's not saying that we are good, but that we are filled with goodness, which means that we are filled with God. Uh, and therefore, the character of God is being shaped and formed in us. Uh, as we receive more and more uh, of the knowledge of God. Uh, and so we can always receive. Uh, yes, we have a lot that God has already shown to us uh, and that we can uh, benefit from reading the scriptures, but we should also be uh, open for God to send teachers to teach the word of God. Sometimes uh, today, uh, we'll hear people say that uh, we need to uh, not have those who are specifically called to be teachers and preachers because every Christian should be a teacher uh, and they should all teach one another. Well, that's true, but that does not remove the gift and the ministry calling of a teacher. Uh, a teacher is someone who has been set apart by God to teach God's word. Paul was indeed uh, one of those teachers who was set apart uh, by God to bring that gift to the church. Let's go on to verses 15 and 16. Indeed, boldly I write to you in part as reminding you again through the grace being given to me from God in order that I, may, that I be a servant of Christ Jesus unto the Gentiles, serving the gospel as a priest, in order that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So here Paul asserts his authority to write this letter, reminding them how God showered his grace upon him and raised him up to be a servant to the Gentiles. Now, there were presumably some Jewish believers in the church in Rome. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla may have been two of them, uh, at least, but that by and large, the church in Rome was predominantly Gentile, uh, and God had raised up Paul especially uh, for this ministry to the Gentiles, uh, um, that they might become an acceptable uh, uh, offering to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we know that the Holy Spirit worked in Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, when Peter, uh, in that case, was preaching the gospel and the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his household and they began to uh, prophesy and to speak in tongues. And the other Christians that came along with Peter from Jerusalem, uh, uh, they recognized that this is the same Holy Spirit that fell on them on the day of Pentecost. And so they concluded, uh, I guess God wants the Gentiles to also be a part uh, of the church. Uh, and this is the 
first real major harvest of Gentiles. So even before Paul began his ministry, God was already revealing to the church that the Gentiles uh, were to be a part of God's family and that they also would receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul uh, then took this uh, and brought it out when he went on his missionary journeys all over the world, that wherever he went, uh, as he we see in the book of Acts, that uh, he would oftentimes preach in the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue at first, uh, but then uh, he would get the left foot of fellowship, uh, and then he would begin to minister to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles would believe, and the church would be established. That was God's plan for Paul. Let's continue now, verses 17 through 21. Uh, Therefore, I have a boast in Christ Jesus, things before God. For I will not dare something to say of which Christ did not work through me unto the obedience of the Gentiles, in word and in work, in miracles and signs and wonders, in the miracles of the Spirit of God, so that I from Jerusalem and the circle around Illyricum to make full the gospel of Christ. Indeed, thus aspiring to preach where Christ is not named, in order that I do not build upon the foundation of another, but just as it has been written to those whom it has been reported concerning him, they shall see, and those not having heard, they shall understand. So Paul does not look at his work as his own, but rather as the work of Christ through him. Not I, but Christ uh, who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. But he's not going to speak of what Christ worked through others, but only of what Christ worked through him. Indeed, he also had the marks of an apostle, the signs, the miracles, and the wonders, uh, which were... Uh, oftentimes seen uh, as the evidence that someone truly was an apostle. Uh, And uh, this is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. If you just want to look over there at that cross-reference, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, so Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. The signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all patience, signs, indeed, and wonders and miracles. And this was meant to establish Paul's authority. He was not less of an apostle than the other apostles, or even a less of an apostle than the 12 apostles who had walked with Jesus. Uh, and so he spread the gospel, uh, bringing it out to the faraway places that he had made it even as far as Illyricum uh, and the surrounding area of Illyricum. Now, Illyricum uh, is about as close that he could get to Rome without getting to Rome. Uh, Illyricum is the uh, east side of the Adriatic Sea. Uh, And you may remember that on the east of the boot of Italy, there is the Adriatic Sea. Well, across from Italy is Illyricum. So he got pretty close to getting to Rome, but not quite. Nevertheless, his plan is that he was going to get there soon. Uh, But his real goal is to keep going as far as he can to preach the gospel, because he did not want to build on the foundation of others. But he wanted to to establish the churches himself. Uh, And he wanted to build the foundation of the churches that he would reach. He didn't want to be redundant and to simply go and uh, help people who had already become Christians uh, through the ministry of others. But that's an apostle. You know, a pastor and teacher is different. A pastor and a teacher uh, or an elder, sometimes they're called elders, presbyters, Sometimes they're called overseers, bishops, uh, but they're all the same, basically. Their job is to build on the foundation that was laid by the apostles. 
Uh, and Paul uh, didn't want, uh, didn't feel that God had called him to be a pastor or teacher, but God had called him to be an apostle to raise up new churches that would be built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Uh, and so that was his goal, was to go beyond Rome, that he would stop and see them on the way, but that his intent was to go much further. In fact, his hope was to even get to Spain, uh, which we're not quite sure uh, whether he got there or not. Well, let's go now to, to Romans chapter 15. We're going to read 22 to 33. It says, But therefore I have been hindered many times to come to you, but now alone, no longer having a place in these regions and having confidence to come to you from many years, as I would proceed into Spain. For I will hope passing to see you and from you to be sent there, if from you first I shall be in part satisfied. Uh, but now I proceed to Jerusalem serving the saints. For I delight in Macedonia, delighted in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, some sharing to make unto the poor of the saints in Jerusalem. For I thought it good, and as their debtor, for if they shared their spiritual thing with the Gentiles, that they ought also in physical things to, to be served by them, that the Gentiles to serve them. Therefore, having finished and delivering to them uh, sealed this fruit, I shall pass through you uh, into Spain. Indeed, I know that coming to you uh, uh, in coming to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Indeed, I encourage you, brothers, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit to assist me in the prayers on behalf of me to God, in order that I would be rescued from the disobedient in Judea, and my service would be pleasing to the saints, in order that in joy coming to you through the will of God, I would be refreshed by you. Indeed, the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. So here again, Paul relates his future plans to visit them on his way to Spain. But first, he's going to make a trip to Jerusalem. Uh, and we know from the book of Acts that he did this uh, and that it delayed uh, his trip to Rome, that he did take the collection of the Gentiles to bring down to the poor and needy saints in Jerusalem who were being persecuted uh, in order that they may be refreshed and that the Gentiles who received spiritual uh, blessings from the believers uh, in Jerusalem who sent out the uh, apostles to establish the church among the Gentiles, that they would in turn give some physical blessing and material or financial blessing back to those uh, who were in Jerusalem. Uh, but Paul recognized uh, that there would be trouble uh, and that, uh, uh, that he got delayed in Jerusalem because he was arrested, this we know from the book of Acts. Uh, but eventually he did make it to Rome uh, at the government expense. So he went on Rome's uh, or Caesar's uh, nickel. Uh, and as a prisoner is how he actually got to Rome. So let's read verses 22 through 24. But therefore, I have been hindered many times to come to you but now no longer having a place in these regions and having confidence to come to you for many years as I would proceed into Spain. For I will hope passing to see you and from you to be sent there if from you first I shall be in part satisfied. So Paul wants to go to Rome uh, in order to be assisted uh, um, and going beyond Rome as far as Spain. Because you see, the church in Rome was already established. The foundation had been laid there. Uh, so uh, his purpose in going to Rome was not so that he could um, uh, serve his apostolic role as giving a foundation uh, for the church uh, because the church was already founded. 
He just basically wanted to stop there for a little bit uh, and be uh, refreshed by fellowship with them. Uh, and then uh, also perhaps that they could uh, help him uh, in continuing his journey on to Spain. So uh, uh, Paul never saw himself as a pastor. He, he did appoint uh, elders to do the pastoring after he was he left. Uh, he never spent more than just a uh, a few uh, months, at, at usually only a few months, sometimes a little bit longer, a year, two years at the very max uh, before he would move on to begin to establish the church somewhere else because he wasn't a pastor. Uh, he wasn't, he did not have that role uh, for himself. Uh, now, uh, the churches then uh, called pastors uh, and Paul uh, and others like the, the apostles would lay hands on them and they would begin to pastor the church in a particular group. So Paul was not that, but he always saw the importance of that, uh, that it not be something that is neglected, that they be left to kind of fend for themselves, uh, that there was always an importance of having leadership. Another little interesting tidbit is that it seems uh, from the New Testament that a churches never just had one pastor, but they had a group of pastors, elders, they called them. And perhaps uh, some of them were teaching elders uh, that were raised up to teach the word of God. Um, but again, that was not Paul. His intention was to go on, probably not just to Spain, but all the way along uh, maybe the French Riviera, River, River, Riviera uh, and all the way down into Spain, of course, uh, you know, these places had different names uh, back then, but uh, that was his uh, goal was to get there and to preach the gospel all along the way. So apparently uh, at that point, no one had gotten further than Rome to preach the gospel. So Paul wanted that to be his purpose uh, and that he would go there uh, and bring the good news of Jesus. Now, some Ancient traditions say that Paul actually made it to Spain. Uh, others uh, say no, that he actually died in Rome. Uh, according to uh, church history and church traditions, uh, Paul was executed by beheading uh, and that uh, he, that happened under Nero. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's possible, and this is one of the things that Again, there's uh, testimony on both sides of this issue that Paul uh, was arrested by Nero uh, and stayed in prison. Uh, uh, actually, no, it, with that, that Paul, uh, before the, the persecution under Nero, actually was released and he went to Rome and then came back. And that's when the persecution broke out and when Paul was beheaded by Nero. We don't know that from the Bible. Uh, we're not told that, but that's just one of the ancient traditions. So uh, let's go on to verses 25 to 20 through 27. But now I proceed to Jerusalem serving the saints, for I delighted in Macedonia and Achaia, some sharing to make unto the poor of the saints in Jerusalem, for I thought it good and as their debtor for if they shared their spiritual thing with the Gentiles, that they ought also in physical things to serve them. So um, again, uh, the detailed description of Paul going to Jerusalem uh, is found in the book of Acts. Uh, and uh, uh, we can read those stories about how he went to Caesarea uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Macedonia, Achaia. Well, actually, um, he went to Caesarea uh, before going to Rome. Uh, so he went to Jerusalem and then Caesarea and then Rome. And then uh, he goes uh, to Jerusalem with the offering from the Macedonians and the Achaeans. Uh, hope I'm being clear there. I'm getting a little, uh, my words are getting a little bit off, but 
Uh, I hope that's clear. So he goes to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, he gets, he gets arrested. He was a Caesarean and into Rome. But while he was in Jerusalem, he brought this gift to them from Macedonia and Achaia. Uh, and he goes into the temple to fulfill a vow, but a disturbance breaks out in the temple and the Roman tribune uh, arrests him, which really saved his life. They would have killed him. Uh, and the Jews then hatch a plot to assassinate Paul, uh, and they ask for the governor, uh, for the tribune, rather, to uh, bring Paul out to face charges, but they were going to murder him on the way. Uh, Paul's nephew uh, hears the rumor, goes into prison uh, to visit Paul, tells him, Paul says, go tell this to the tribune, and then the tribune uh, whisks Paul away to Caesarea, uh, at night, in the middle of the night, with some soldiers and some uh, cavalry, uh, and they take him up to Caesarea. Uh, and there he stands before uh, Felix. Uh, he uh, gets a hearing from Felix, who finds no guilt in him, but because Paul appealed to Caesar so as not to be taken back to Jerusalem, uh, he keeps him locked up until Festus comes along and becomes the next uh, governor in that area, uh, and he is uh, then given another hearing before Festus, uh, who also invited King Agrippa uh, and his wife Bernice uh, to hear uh, this uh, uh, testimony of Paul, uh, but uh, uh, they say they can't find anything he did wrong, uh, and if it had not been that he appealed to Caesar, they would have just let him go, but because he appealed to Caesar, and was willing to be judged before Caesar. They said, well, you want to go to Caesar, so you're going to go to Caesar. So he's sent to Rome as a prisoner. Nevertheless, Paul was able to fulfill his commitment to bring an offering to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem, uh, which he felt was the Gentile believers due since they had been given the spiritual blessings uh, of the gospel by the Jewish believers. Well, verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> Therefore, having finished and delivering to them, sealed this fruit, I shall pass through you unto Spain. Indeed, I know that coming to you, uh, in, uh, I shall come in the fullness <clears throat> of the blessing of Christ. Uh, Paul saw this ministry as a blessing of Christ. His arrival uh, in Rome on his way to Spain will be a joy for Paul, as he will finally get to meet these Christians whom formerly he had only heard about, probably from Aquila and Priscilla, but the blessing is not just uh, from them to Paul, but also Paul to them. He's going to do some teaching while he's there and share with them uh, his understanding and the insights the Holy Spirit has given to him from the Word, particularly about the Gentiles being included in God's plan. And then we go to verses 30 uh, uh, through verse 33. Indeed, I encourage you, brothers, through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, to assist me in prayer, in the prayers on behalf of me to God, in order that I would be rescued from the disobedient in Judea and my service would be pleasing to the saints and order that in joy coming to you through the will of God, I would be refreshed by you. Indeed, the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. Now, Paul asks for their prayers, knowing that he is going to face trouble when he got to Jerusalem, uh, that there would be persecution awaiting him there. Now, he knew that, uh, not only because of what God was speaking into his own heart, but he also knew that because of a prophet whose name was Agabus. And uh, uh, we read that Agabus prophesied such in Acts 21, 10 to 13. So if you want to turn over to Acts 21, Acts is the book just before the book of Romans. So Acts 21, 10 through 13, go over there in your Bibles, Acts 21, 10 to 13. And there we read, Indeed, 
remaining many days, a certain prophet from Judea came down by the name of Agabus and coming to us and taking the belt of Paul after binding his feet and hands said, this one says the spirit of the Lord, the man of which is this belt. Thus the Jews shall bind in Jerusalem and they shall hand him over to the hands of the Gentiles. Indeed, as we heard these things, we and the locals begged him in order that he not go up to Jerusalem. But Paul answered, why are you crying and breaking my heart? For I not, uh, for I not only uh, to be arrested, but to die in Jerusalem. I have preparation on behalf of the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul knew what he would face when he got there, but he could not be dissuaded, uh, even though he knew that persecution was going to be there. But nevertheless, uh, he trusted God that God would indeed uh, take care of him. But even if he was killed in Jerusalem, that didn't make any difference to Paul. He said, if I, if I go there and I die, well, to live as Christ, to die as gain, as he wrote in the Philippians. Um, but his purpose uh, was to go there and then from there to go to Rome and beyond. Well, that ends chapter 15. Now we have uh, a little bit more in Romans 16, but as I said, this will probably go pretty quickly because a lot of it is uh, simply greetings. Uh, and we uh, read beginning at verse 1 through verse 16. And I recommend to you Phoebe, our sister, being a servant or deacon of the church in Sancria, in order that she may be received uh, in the Lord and worthy of the saints <clears throat> and would offer to her and whatever of you she has a practical need. For also she became a helper of many and of me myself. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, which on behalf of, of my, uh, uh, of behalf of me, uh, they live and have presented, or rather on behalf of my life, they have presented their own necks, which not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles and church uh, and the church at their house. Uh, greet them too. Greet Epinatus, my beloved. He is the first of Asia in Christ. Greet Mary, who toiled much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives and my fellow prisoners, which are outstanding among the apostles, which also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Orbanus, my co-worker in Christ, and Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apelles, the one tested in Christ. Greet those of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those of Narcissus, the ones being in the Lord. Greet Trephena and Trephosa, the workers of the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved, who toiled much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, the elect in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet uh, Asyncritus, uh, Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobus, Her uh, uh, Hermes, Hermes and Hermes, uh, and the brothers with them. Greet Philogus, uh, Philogus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. And then, so he, or here, we have uh, Paul giving his final greetings, uh, personalizing the letter. Uh, he obviously knew a lot of believers in Rome. He must have met them on his journeys while uh, they were traveling and he was traveling. Uh, maybe he met quite a few of them in Illyricum, since Illyricum is not very far from Rome. Uh, but uh, much of these people are obscure. Most of these people really are obscure. 
and unknown outside of Paul and the Christians in Rome. So we're only going to uh, briefly comment on a few. Uh, in verse 1, he mentions Phoebe, who was called a deaconess, uh, who did much to serve the church in Sancria. So deaconesses were, uh, as female deacons, servants of the church, were already active uh, in the first century. Verse 3, Aquila and Priscilla were believing Jewish tent makers that Paul met in Corinth. And he worked with them for a while as a tent maker. He had basically run out of money. The money that the church had given him to support him on his missionary journey ran out. So he had to stop and, and work for a while. Uh, and uh, Aquila and Priscilla uh, allowed him to work with them in their business. And Paul says they risked their lives for him, right? They stuck out their necks for him. Uh, and they at some time uh, must have returned to Rome because Paul is speaking of them as being in Rome. They also had a house church that met in their home. Down in verse 7, he mentions uh, Andronicus and Junia, uh, who he calls relatives. Well, what does he mean by that? Um, it is unlikely that they were his physical relatives uh, because uh, they uh, had been uh, converted before Paul. So he's probably referring to them uh, as uh, spiritual relatives that we have no indication that any of Paul's family became Christians before he did. Uh, so could it have been? Well, it's possible, but we have no evidence that that happened. And then verse 13, he mentions Rufus. Now, Rufus may have been the same Rufus who was the son of Simon of Cyrene, the one who carried the cross of Jesus. He, along with his brother Alexander, who's also mentioned in Mark 15, 21, that, that Simon was the father of Rufus and Alexander. Well, if it's the same Rufus, then he must have traveled to Rome. Let's go on now and read verses uh, 17 to 27. Romans 16, 17 to 27. And I beg you, brothers, to watch out for those making dissensions and offenses from the teaching which you learned and avoid them. For such as these do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own bellies. And through kind words and blessings, they deceive the hearts of the innocent. For your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore, uh, over you I rejoice. Indeed, I wish you to be wise unto the good, but innocent unto the evil. Indeed, the God of peace uh, crush Satan under your feet soon. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my co-worker, greets you, and Luke and Jason and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, the, writing, uh, the one writing the epistle, greets you uh, in the Lord. Gaius, my guest, greets you and the whole church. Erastus, the steward of the city, and Quartus, the brother, greets you. And to him, being able to establish you according to my gospel and the message of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation in ages past, having been hidden, but now being revealed through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God, unto the obedience of faith, being known to all the Gentiles to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, Paul here uh, says in verses 17 to 18, I beg you, brothers, to watch out for those making dissensions and offenses uh, from the teaching which you learned and avoid them. For such as these do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own bellies. And through kind words and blessings, 
they deceive the hearts of the innocent. So Paul gives them a final warning here uh, to watch out for those who would twist the gospel and cause dissensions and offenses to rise up in the church and deceive the hearts of the innocent. His call is to avoid them. He's probably thinking here primarily uh, of what became known as the Judaizers, those who were saying that Paul was only giving a half the message and that if the Gentiles wanted to truly be saved, they had to be circumcised and begin to follow all the legal practices uh, of the Jews. Uh, and they were coming in and they were causing divisions in the church. Paul says, avoid them, have nothing to do with them. Then in verses 19 to 20, for your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore over you I rejoice. Indeed, I wish you to be wise unto the good, but innocent unto the evil. Indeed, the God of peace crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. The church in Rome had already gained a reputation for their faithfulness. So Paul rejoices over them and wants them to continue to be wise uh, and good and innocent about the evil. Uh, then he makes an interesting statement about God crushing Satan under their feet. Now, this was from the first prophecy of the Messiah uh, that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden, where it says the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So obviously, the way that Jesus is doing this, as Paul indicates here, is through the church, that he uses the church to crush the head of the serpent. Now, of course, he gave the fatal blow when he went to the cross and then rose again. Uh, but the devil uh, is still deceiving the nations. And so what Paul wants is for the church to be active and bold in their witness that they crush Satan's head uh, under their feet. Well, this is God's work through the church. And this is verses uh, 21 to 23 uh, mentions uh, Tertius, uh, who was uh, evidently Paul's secretary, uh, because he is the one who is writing. Paul is uh, dictating this letter, but Tertius is writing down. So he says, I'm the one who is writing these words down. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, he adds some final greetings. Uh, the notables are here, uh, Timothy, Luke and Gaius. Now, Timothy, we know, is uh, uh, one who did, Paul discipled. Uh, and then Luke was the great physician who traveled with Paul uh, and then uh, did that uh, very careful research uh, to give us the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts. And Gaius. Uh, Gaius is mentioned along with Aristarchus in Acts 19.29 as being dragged out of Ephesus during a riot that was started by a silversmith named Demetrius, who earned a living by making idols uh, of the goddess Artemis. And so a riot broke out. Uh, they protected Paul. Uh, he wanted to go and, and get right in the middle of this riot, but they held him back fearing that he would die. Uh, but Gaius, uh, was dragged out of town uh, and uh, and beaten. Uh, so uh, he was a, a warrior for Christ. And then going to verses 25 through 27. And to him being able to, uh, to who being able to establish you according to my gospel and the message of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation in ages past, having been hidden, but now being revealed through the prophetic scriptures, according to the command of the eternal God, under the obedience of faith, being made known to all the Gentiles, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. 
So Paul uh, ends this letter by pointing to God as the one who would establish every believer through the eternal gospel. This gospel had been revealed in the Old Testament, but it was hidden from their eyes, as we've seen, the eyes of the Jews. But now Paul brings it out, uh, and it was always, although it was always there. And so it is with God's word, that it is the basis of our faith. And it's the one thing that will keep us strong in the faith until the end. You cannot be a strong Christian without being a Christian of the word. Uh, so we need to remember that. That word is the one that is going to establish us. But all glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as the formula of the Reformation goes, it is all by scripture alone, grace alone, and faith alone. The three solas. Others add a couple more, Christ alone and, uh, and uh, what is it, the Spirit alone. Uh, but uh, uh, the actual ones, at least, that the Lutheran reformers spoke about are scripture alone, grace alone, and faith alone. So uh, let's close now uh, this Bible study as we have come to an end. I hope that you've been blessed by it and that it has nurtured you in your faith. So Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given to us your word. And we pray, O oh Father, that uh, as we have now come to the end of this Bible study on Romans, uh, Lord, that you would uh, just continue to build us up so that we are strong in faith and that we can withstand all the attacks of the enemy. And so, Father, we pray this in the mighty, precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.